Joseph in chapter 37, which has been a few weeks ago. He's been stripped of his clothes, thrown into a pit by his ten uh, older brothers who never had a good word to say to him. And, uh, and he uh, uh, basically went through uh, an upbringing of their verbal abuse. Eventually, uh, they believe they're going to leave him in the pit to, to die. And then the uh, plan is changed. Uh, and he is sold into slavery. The Ishmaelites then take him down uh, to Egypt, and we find him arriving in Egypt today. There uh, is so much uh, about this story in terms of uh, the personal integrity of, of Joseph himself. Uh, we made parallels uh, between he and the life of Daniel, both young teenagers ripped out of their homes and uh, taken to uh, what would that be? Uh, not just a foreign country, but a country at the time, what was the epicenter in both cases, Babylon and Egypt, the epicenter of spiritual darkness on the planet at the time. Uh, just a horrific environment for both of them to be in. And yet, like Daniel, Joseph is able to remain faithful to God. And uh, it's an incredible uh, adventure that he's on. And in this passage, we're seeing he goes from the pit to the penthouse and then to the prison. Is he in the center of God's will? Yes. Does that mean that everything's going to go well for him? No. Uh, but even in the bad times, he remains faithful to God. There's so much that we can uh, learn, learn from him. But a monumental task that he has before him. Keep in mind, as he would have descended into the Nile Valley, he would have seen the pyramids that were already there. The uh, famous uh, Egyptian fifth... 15th dynasty was in full swing and prospering under Hykos, who was the ruler from, uh, again, this dynasty from about 1720 to about 1570. We'll talk more uh, as we get to the, uh, the portion of the narrative where he uh, is, Joseph is introduced to the, uh, the Pharaoh himself. Uh, God's fingerprints are so over all of this, it's just unbelievable. Even as we get to that point, and of course, if you know the story, from the prison, he then goes to the palace, uh, where he becomes the ruler in command of the most powerful nation on the earth at the time, second only to Pharaoh. Why would a Pharaoh choose somebody like Joseph to give him that much power? Well, one of the reasons, he's not Egyptian. That's very interesting. He's actually a Semitic person himself, and you could see why in that position, he could see a young guy like Joseph and go, that's a guy I can trust. And uh, it's very interesting how God orchestrates all these things. We're going to find out in this text that God even gave Joseph the right genes, apparently, of his mother, who was, well, we know she's good looking, and so is he. Very important in the Egyptian culture. God is, is, is all about orchestrating Joseph getting to the right place at the right time so that he can save and remove the tribes of Jacob, which might have been overrun in the land they're living if they began to grow too powerful. The Hittites or somebody else there might have said, yeah, those guys are getting a little too big. We better do away with them and, uh, and protect what we've got. God removes them in those small numbers and puts them in Goshen in Egypt where they can grow to be a, a, a nation of, uh, of uh, several millions before they are then delivered out of Egypt. But uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, again, Joseph would, could have been taken to anywhere in North Africa. Uh, this caravan route continued, but no, he is sold in Egypt where God wants him. He is sold to Potiphar where God wants him. He is not made a field servant, which he could have been. He is made a household servant where God wanted him to be so that he would be noticed and Potiphar would notice God's hand upon him and elevate him to a, bit, a position where he could then be falsely accused of a sexual crime so he could get him into prison, so he could wait several years, so he could interpret dreams, so that he could finally get to the place where God could use him. Well, let's take a look at the, uh, the first six verses. We'll see that Joseph was given an exalted position by the Lord. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, uh, brought, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. Uh, he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw the Lord was with him. And the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Thus he made him overseer of his house and all that he put under his authority. So it was from the time he had 
made him overseer of his house uh, in all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. So again, very successful at this point, and uh, raised up to this exalted position. So the first note of that his position is, well, it's obvious. He's elevated because of the Lord's blessing. A couple of key verses here. Verse 2, uh, it says that he was successful. Uh, it tells us where he is, the master of the, uh, the house of the, um, his master of the Egyptian. In verse 3 it says, and his master saw, even Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. That's in verse 2 at the beginning of the story. Jump down to verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Verse 23, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. How would you like to be a successful young man and everything you do prosper? Yeah, that sounds good to me. How's the false accusation of a sexual crime sound? Well, I don't think I really like that part. How's the prison sound for several years? Not sure I'm really up for that either. Uh, but God was in all of these details. Uh, and God's hand was on Joseph, and it was obvious to the prison uh, keeper. It was obvious to Potiphar. Potiphar, again, uh, a guy in real standing in terms of Egypt, the uh, Egyptian military, and person, uh, a person who was assigned to the pharaoh, uh, from what I can read from others, uh, of his bodyguard. He's a captain. Uh, he is somebody. That's why we say Joseph went from the pit to the penthouse. Uh, he's probably living in some... Uh, uh, pretty nice digs at, at this point. And he's a household servant, but the Lord is with him. Notice that it's capital L-O-R-D. It's Yahweh. It's the covenant name of God, which occurs eight times uh, in this verse. Twice in verse 2, twice in verse 3, twice in verse 5, once in verse 21, twice in verse 23. The covenant name of God. All of the promises given to Abraham that were given to Isaac, that were given to Jacob, are bearing upon Joseph now. How does he get through all of this? How does he not become cynical and, and bitter over all that's happened to him? Every reason in the world for him to be an angry young man, but he's not. He's trusting and he's gracious and he sees the hand of God on him. And I think we see something here right away. He knows that God's hand is upon him. He knows that God's promises are true. He knows that God will keep those covenant promises. He knows that God gave him a dream and whatever else happens in his life, he knows he'll see his brothers one day and they will bow before him, not in anger. He knows he'll see his father again. Doesn't know how, doesn't know how it'll be orchestrated, uh, but he'll see them all one day again. How does he get through it? There's a young guy that hangs on to God's word, hangs on to the promises of God that God has given him. And certainly there's something to be seen there in our own ability to recognize when God's hand is upon us. The second thing about his position that we've mentioned, it's elevated to overseer. So he doesn't start out there, but Potiphar sees that uh, Joseph is, well, he's the super slave. <laughs> and, uh, and even this uh, secular guy, well, pagan guy, uh, worshiping what he will, he's so pagan that he won't allow Joseph, notice, to have anything to do with his food because that was tied into, well, his spiritual life. A lot of the food that he ate would have been offered to God's previously or a, quote, ceremony done over it. So that, well, that he keeps to himself. But everything else he allows Joseph to have complete authority over. He sees the hand of the Lord over, over Joseph. And, uh, and he sees that, well, everything in his home, everything in the fields, it's all being blessed because of Joseph. May it be said of all of us that uh, uh, lo the Lord's hand would be upon us in such a way that God would bless the business, the company, the people we're with simply because of our presence there. And I believe he does it. Uh, you know, I just kind of hear the testimonies, especially from some of some of the guys, and uh, and certainly we're we're thankful. You know, and uh, when when God does bless somebody's business, and when it's evident to uh, to others, when other guys are out of work, sometimes these guys aren't, and uh, 
we uh, uh, love to go down and visit Charlie at, uh, at Group Builders because those guys are thankful for what God's done in preserving their, their business. His, their business is, uh, for as a large construction company in this economy, has done very well, and it's an anomaly. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. And uh, I remember uh, Charlie took me out to the Disney project there as they were kind of doing the top-off thing and, you know, rode the, uh, the rickety elevators, which uh, are apparently John's favorite thing to ride in out there, uh, going up to the top. And uh, I tell you, I've never seen so many happy, happy construction workers. <laughs> they're usually kind of like, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, they're not the happiest campers around out there working hard in the hot sun, lots of dust and uh, long hours, long labor. But uh, these guys on that project, they didn't, they didn't lose their homes. They could have. They could have lost everything. You know, unemployment's not enough to cover their mortgages and their truck payments and all that, but uh, these guys were surviving. They were thrilled to have a job. They were happy construction workers on that job site out there. That was a critical time in the economy of the country and here in Hawaii. And I believe it's because Charlie's there and God's blessing the place. There's a few other people I think there that uh, recognize that as well. Does God still do Joseph kinds of things today? He absolutely, absolutely does. And uh, if we'll look around and see it and, and recognize it and give him the thanks for it. I've seen other guys in the church that they get so many promotions. And of course, they're not the ones to tell me. I have to hear it from somebody else that uh, I can hardly keep up with it. And I have a phrase for them. I don't usually say it to them, but I say it to Kathy. I see that guy's a Joseph. Every time I turn around, the guy's getting promoted again. It's un unbelievable. A lot of guys would have been in that same position for 20 years. He's already promote, been promoted five times. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's unreal. I was, uh, we ran into uh, uh, one of their, Kathy's cousins at Costco one day, and we were talking about one of the guys from the fellowship. And he says, yeah, I, I, yeah we, we work together sometimes uh, out there at Pearl Harbor. And then he says, do you know how much responsibility that guy has? And I said, no, I really don't. Tell me. He's got 100 guys working for him. Really? Uh, it's just, you know, it's unbelievable the, the responsibility that God gives to uh, men and women that will walk in with him in integrity. And we'll look at uh, Joseph's integrity uh, here in a moment. The third thing about this position in Egypt, as I mentioned before, it includes a description of his physical appearance. Uh, the end of verse 6. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Handsome in form means he was ripped, yeah, is what it means. He, he, he was built. Appearance means he, he was a handsome guy. Uh, this becomes a big thing in that culture because probably the only other culture that was more uh, intrigued with looking youthful than our own was, it, was the Egyptian culture. They're all, they're all about the cosmetics. They're all about what they wear. They're all about trying to stay young and look young and so forth. And God is going to use Joseph to be the leader of this country. And, uh, and Joseph would be uh, a man that the people in that culture would readily uh, you know, look to. And his words would resonate with them. And they would trust him because, well, he was the epitome of what they wanted to see and wanted to be like themselves. God put in the genes of Joseph what he needed to put him in a particular place to use him in a particular time. It makes us think of the story of, of Esther, who, uh, again, because of her beauty, wins this, uh, this contest to become the queen, and, of course, is there in those uh, epic words, for such a time as this. God orchestrates even our genetic makeup uh, that he might use us in the lives of, of other people. It's an amazing thing. Uh, he was, uh, he was there, again, the same phrase of used of his, uh, his mother, Rachel, uh, and therefore we know that uh, he, uh, he, got the, he got the good looking genes from, from her. But he's in an exalted position, is by the Lord, and that's very, very obvious, and God's got, uh, got a plan for Joseph. The second thing we note, though, in verse 17 to 18, because of these good looks, because of this exalted position, what God is doing, well, now there's a particular problem. Uh, in verse 7, it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. Pretty subtle. Verse 8. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is, 
uh, with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to jo Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time, when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until her, his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came into me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So quite the scene here. First thing we notice is problem. Well, it's Potiphar's wife. And, and again, we would say she becomes the prototype of all fatal attractions. Uh, as she uh, comes to him and, quote, cast longing eyes on Joseph. So, uh, again, she's uh, probably a, a woman who's uh, in a position of power herself in this home and somebody that uh, apparently is used to getting her, her way. Uh, and this is how it begins in terms of this infidelity and the, uh, the sexual ex escapade that's going on here and in people's lives today. It begins with this longing look, not just a look, but... Uh, uh, you know, but the, the longing, the, the looking again, like many of the uh, preachers of another generation would, uh, would say, it's that second look that, that gets you in trouble. And uh, something we're warned about by Jesus uh, when he says, if you look after another woman lustfully, it's as if you've already sinned uh, in terms of uh, having done it. Uh, Psalm 1937 says, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. Job 31.1 says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? And um, there's so much we can learn from him so that we don't fall into uh, this kind of sexual sin. But again, 17-year-old Joseph, uh, amazing how he reacts. After all, think of some of the reasons well, you talk about being able to rationalize. He could have thought this. Well, the obvious, no one would ever know. His family is on the other side of the Sinai. How in the world would they ever find out? Uh, he was a slave. Therefore, his life was in his own. She's the boss. After all, I'm just complying. Uh, and sexual promiscuity was a daily part of slaveholding in that culture, as it is today, unfortunately. And besides uh, giving in to her, he could be enhancing his own career by, by doing this. There's a young guy that could have, uh, well, we're all pretty good at this, the rationalization. Well, you know, she doesn't have anyone really to talk to. You know, I'm just like a very good friend. No, you're like an idiot. You know, it's, you know, this, you know, it's all, it always, you know, it always goes down this, this road where people are blinded and they're, and they're not, uh, not thinking. I, um, and, uh, and Hollywood's, uh, you know, really good at this. I'm trying to think of the name of the movie. Is it uh, uh, Water for Elephants or something like that? Anybody see that, that film? But uh, here's a you know, pretty good film and, uh, and everything. But uh, what, was the, what was the moral message of the movie? The moral message was is that if you've got this gal and she's got a husband, of course, uh, they, they want to justify the adultery. So how do they justify the adultery to say, under certain circumstances, it's okay? Under certain circumstances, it's okay. They make her husband a little older. They make him physically and uh, emotionally abusive uh, and absent and just a cruel guy. So the meaner he gets, and then you get the young guy that comes along and he's... Uh, He's helpful, and they grow in their relationship. It doesn't happen overnight. It's very slow and so forth. And then he is betrayed, and he's ridiculed, and he has difficulty in his life, and somehow they end up together, and they fall in love. And it's all seen by Hollywood, of course, as a, as a wonderful thing. 
they're committing adultery. Well, cause why? Well, after all, the other, the other guy's abusive. It's always, always justified. And uh, there's lots of films I could, I could go on like that. And, uh, and uh, it's good. It's good to think about what is the moral message <laughs> in this film? What are they portraying? What are they trying to, uh, to teach here? Easy to rationalize. Joseph could have rationalized this very easily. One writer said, add to this the fact that Joseph knew the dysfunction of a father's favoritism, the scorn of 10 brothers' hatred, the betrayal of being sold for profit by those responsible for him, the disdain of a slave's life as chattel, and the dissolution of transplantation to foreign soil and culture. With this as his bio, Joseph had every reason to be angry, bitter, resentful, cynical, fearful, self-serving, and self-pitying. Joseph had every human reason to find fleeting solace in an illicit embrace, frankly, to act out. And after all, he was the victim in the story. Pretty tough to resist, huh? I mean, you could understand if, if Joseph wasn't who he was in terms of his characters and integrity, it would be so easy to go down this road. And, uh, and we notice that, uh, secondly, about his, the problem uh, is his response. It's in a godly, a godly manner. And, of course, his response is based on his relationship in the Lord. Look at the last half of verse 8. Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he's committed all that he has to my hand. There's no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness? And sin against who? His master? No, sin against God. In short, he's saying that to sin would be to break this tremendous trust that Potiphar has given him. Uh, to sin would be to sin against God uh, himself. There's two things that at least I take away from how Joseph resists this sexual temptation. And one is, as I've already mentioned, is the integrity of his life. Joseph is not compromising in other areas, small areas, white light, little things. He's not doing that so that this is, well, it's one more thing down that road. He's not doing that at all. This is a guy with real integrity. He's always honest. He's always truthful. He never cheats. He never steals. He never lies. He never slanders. He never is bitter. He's never cynical. He never does any of these things. So now when it comes to this, it's just like, this ain't happening. I ain't doing this. It's not like, oh, <laughs> baby. <laughs> He's not even considering it. He's just like, this, I'm out of here. And this would be, he sees it as a, what does he say? A great wickedness. We don't really see it that way. Today in this culture, it's a affair. <laughs> see, that sounds better than a great wickedness. How are you doing? I'm committing great wickedness. You know, you know people don't really express it that way. Sinning against a holy and a righteous God who loves me. Sinning against, you know, see, we just don't express it that way. The world sees it completely different. But here was a guy that uh, had tremendous integrity in his life. He was faithful in all of his relationships. Therefore, he would be faithful in this one. One writer said, we must understand that little sins pave the way to big sins and that Joseph was on no such path. And then secondly, it was a great awareness that God was, was with him. Uh, Joseph had a concept of what we sometimes call the meta-narrative, the big story. He understood the big story. There was a God. He was made in the image of God. God had promises and a plan for him, for his family, and for his future. And he was going to hang on to those promises. He had a sense that God was with him. As he worked and things flourished, it, he didn't say, I'm a pretty smart guy, the way this is working out here. You know, I've turned a bad situation pretty good here. No, he was saying, God was with me. God is doing this. God is the one. How does Potiphar know that it's God? I got a feeling Joseph is telling him, hey, you're doing a great job. Hey, it's the Lord. God is good. You know, I think there's a young guy that gave God the glory all the time because there was a constant recognition that God was in his presence always. And I think that was another factor. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? It reminds you of the line of David when he kind of comes to his own senses and realizes to that line and that story and the response to Nathan, the prophet, in terms of his own sin with Bathsheba, he says, against God and only God, thee, only thee, have I sinned. Did he sin against Bathsheba? Yes, he did. 
Her husband? Yes, he did. The other men that were killed with him? Yes, he did. I mean, we could go on and on. The people that he hurt because of his sin. But the bottom line, he was against God, who loved him so much, had been so kind, who had been so gracious, who had raised him up as a shepherd boy. When he was disenfranchised by his own family, by his father, by his brothers in a similar way. But God still watched over him, ministered to him. But uh, Joseph doesn't go the way of, of David. Uh, he's a guy that uh, knew what it was to live in the presence of God no matter what he was. Uh, notice verse 10, the temptation was persistent. It wasn't a one-shot deal. So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or even to be with her. He's trying to avoid the situation. And again, his example is, uh, is, uh, is one that we can, we can learn for. You know, he gets caught by her, but he's trying to even just avoid and not be around. He doesn't have the, uh, uh, the, the potential, the possibility to say, uh, you know, this is a bad situation here. I think I'll transfer over to another house here and be the overseer over there. No, he's a slave. You know, he's doing his best in the context of what he's in to completely uh, avoid her. And um, it's something we need to learn. Can we all figure it out when somebody's hitting on us either way? Can we kind of figure that out? And just try to either say, you say the, hey, no, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Or, and then avoid and be able to avoid. Somebody asked me one time, was describing the situation where that was going on. And I said, can you uh, move to another department? Or can you, uh, you know, stay clear of this gal somewhere? No, I, I can't. And man, it's just, it's uh, crazy. I said, well, then just quit. What do you mean quit? I I've been in this job for 10 years. Quit. And he's like, I can't quit. Just get another job. Jobs aren't that easy. Hey, what's more important, your marriage, your kids, or, or this whole thing here? If you think you're going to fall because of this gal that's there, quit. That's why people don't come to me for counseling. You know, it's, 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 it doesn't, doesn't always go over real, real, real well. Joseph couldn't quit. That's my whole point. Joseph couldn't quit. He was just stuck. He was just stuck there. But obviously trusting the Lord. This was, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, incident where she grabs his garment, probably maybe a little different. His tunic would have been like a long T-shirt. So that indicates there was a struggle that was going on, and he has to kind of extricate himself out of the situation and, uh, and run, which was uh, the right thing to do. Sometimes a um, particular branch of the military that says they're looking for a few good men. God's looking for a good few cowards. That'll just see the situation and just run the other way. That's what Paul says to young Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee also youthful lust. That means run. But pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now Paul's uh, instructions for temptations in, to the uh, church in Corinth were a little different. 1 Corinthians 10.13. Uh, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. Made us all the same. Well, you know, I, you know, I've kind of fallen here, you know, but, you know, and my situation is really unique. No, it's not. It's the same as everybody else's. It's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. That's it. It's one of those categories. And you, you can either love God or love the things of the world, John says. Nothing unique about your situation. No, you don't really understand, Pastor. You know, this person, you know, really, you know, and you, everybody's got this whole story. No, you don't really. No, I understand. Your temptation is not unique. It's not special. It's just a temptation. It's what everybody faces. Uh, and don't, uh, don't be mistaken. Because that's one of the ploys of the enemy. And let me just tell you. That, that's in his book, Spiritual Warfare 101. Satan's book of spiritual warfare. I don't know if you ever read that or not. But one of the things that's in there is make people think their situation is special and unique. And that way you'll help them rationalize their simple behavior. That's just right in his book. He uses it all, all the time. But Paul says it's, it's common. He says, but, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear up under it. Sometimes you can just bear up under it. There's some temptations that, hey, God is faithful. He's just going to strengthen you, give you the grace uh, to, uh, to over, overcome, whatever it might be. And there's other times like sexual sin where he says, just run. Just run, uh, just, just get out of there, uh, whatever it might be. Joseph's problem third escalates, of course, when he's falsely accused 
uh, by Miss, Mrs. Potiphar. Notice she's a very skilled liar. I don't think this is the first time she's ever lied. Uh, she's pretty good, pretty good at it. Notice verse 14. First thing she does is she enlists the support of the other guys uh, that are working in the house. Do you think some of the other guys were not real thrilled with Joseph? I don't know if you've ever been in a job situation where somebody there is like, he's like bottom rung and all of a sudden he's everybody's boss. Most of the guys aren't real thrilled about that. And uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is Joseph. Uh, verse 14, that she called uh, to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, see, he has brought uh, uh, into us a Hebrew to mock us. Notice it's not mock me. It's not my problem. This is all of our problems. Did you guys know he's laughing at you? He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. Kind of flips your story here a little bit. It's not just about me, you know. This is a really problem for all of us because, after all, you know, yeah, that guy, my husband, he brought this guy. He's a Hebrew. He brought. He's not even Egyptian. He brings him in here, uh, and uh, yeah, he does this. Did you know that he's mocking at you guys? I just thought I'd let you know that. It's pretty. Can tell she's lied before. Uh, so, you know, this is a problem for everybody. So she gets her, uh, her uh, supporting cast all set up uh, so that then when the husband hits the door, they're all like, oh man, you can't believe what happened today. And he's already got news of it before he comes into her. Uh, and then when she does, she's there uh, holding, clenching his garment, swoons just in time for him to uh, grasp her before she falls on the floor. She's so faint because she's so terrified of this horrible experience. And she says, the Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came into me to mock me. In other words, um, a lot of this is your fault there, Mr. Potiphar. Uh, you're the guy that, uh, that brought him in. And notice he's no, longer, he's no longer the overseer. He's just a Hebrew slave. It's that Hebrew slave. He's not just an Egyptian slave. He's not the overseer. He's a Hebrew slave. And a lot of this is your fault why this happened to me. So I'm pretty sure you want to do something about it here. I, I just kind of have to wonder if this situation has ever come up before in this lady's life. Uh, that uh, she's got to be so, uh, uh, so convincing and so forth. But uh, what a horrible thing for Joseph, uh, as we can understand in our own culture today, to be accused of a sexual crime that you did not, did not commit. Um, does that happen? That, that happens today. Uh, we, we read about it uh, uh, in the news in the paper. There's a lot, a lot of pastors, Christian leaders, they accuse of all kinds of things. Absolutely not true. I mean, I just have to tell you, every time there's some guy, story about some guy that's done some horrible thing in the ministry, I don't believe it. I mean, if it really comes out later and the guy really did it and there's some supporting evidence and, you know, it was, it was a real deal, it's like, well, you know, it's a terrible thing then. But right off the bat, just because somebody says it, I, I never believe it anymore. There's too many Mrs. Potiphar's out there. But Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. You're really going really to love this. Uh, you know, I was going to say, people that say they love the Sermon on the Mount, I'm pretty sure they never read it. Because, uh, boy, every time I read it, it just beats me up. It shows me what a wimp I am as far as a Christian. You're going to love this. Jesus says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually really thrilled, you know, when uh, I'm just rejoicing to hear people say horrible things about me. I, for, no, actually, for some reason, I'm not. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I told you I'm just a wimp as a believer because I'm just not usually exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who went before you. Jesus says, listen, it's all going to get worked out in heaven. You're going to get a reward for it. But says that you're in pretty good company. Because they did the same thing against the prophets that went before you. But that's kind of hard to get your mind around at the moment. <laughs> but there's a lot of false accusations that are, uh, that are made out there. And, uh, and it's a real problem. There was a guy in our home fellowship that I was doing even before we uh, planted the church here. So this goes back a couple of decades. He uh, was a pretty successful business guy. He sold real estate. And, uh, and he got accused uh, of a sexual crime, which he didn't do. Uh, but I mean, here he is, picture on the news, you know, the whole thing, everything being said about him. Uh, I mean, and he was just saying, as it all turned out, he, he wasn't even at the right place at the right time. He was in another part of the island. He was in a business meeting. I mean, this, you know, this thing all got dismissed right away. And everybody went, no problem. No, everybody kind of like, whoa, there's that guy. Yeah, that's what they said about him. Yeah, maybe it's true. His career was over. Neighbors treated him different. It was just horrible. He, he moved. He had to relocate to another, to another city on, on the mainland. 
it was all over because because of a false accusation. Should all accusations kind of be checked out? Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, man, what a terrible thing! Does this happen? It still continues to happen. But amazing the reaction of Joseph even in the midst of all of this. God exalts him to a position where basically uh, because of his now being in the home and that kind of influence because of his good looks that the Lord gave him that God wants him to have for what God's going to do in his life later. It seems to get him in trouble here. He's accused falsely of a sexual crime. Uh, but again, his, uh, his integrity and his uh, belief that in the presence of God was protecting him. And he, and he doesn't go south. He doesn't get bitter. He doesn't get cynical. Notice what's happened as he goes again from the pit to the penthouse and now to the prison in verse 19 to 23. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him saying, your servant did to me after this manner that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But, but the Lord, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Uh, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they, uh, uh, they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look and do anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So Joseph is uh, sent to prison. Notice it's the king's prison. It tells us a couple of things. And I think one of the things that might be, maybe should be obvious, but maybe isn't, is that when uh, Potiphar's anger is aroused, I think it's aroused at his wife. Otherwise, he kills Joseph. I mean, Joseph is a slave. He's accused of raping the wife. And, hey, you probably shouldn't do that. So we're going to put you in this, uh, you know, the best prison I can get you in over here. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he doesn't believe his wife or he's executed on the spot. Uh, you know, it, it was, okay, it's her word against his. She's a very skilled liar and manipulator. And then we have Joseph, this young man of incredible integrity. Going with the guy with integrity here, but, you know, it's either, you know, I don't know what he does to his wife, if, you know, uh, is the alternative, but uh, he puts him in the king's prison, which, by the way, would have been a dungeon in 15 BC in Egypt. You know, no AC and no color TVs. It's not quite the image that we, uh, uh, we have today of uh, uh, Halava or anything. Not, not that that's a good place to go to. But, uh, you know, it's, it was, it was a grim, very grim place. Uh, it wasn't an easy thing for him to be thrown into this prison. Uh, but yet it is in the position, it's in the king's prison, well, where the, the butler and the baker would be eventually. And they just show up in a couple of weeks, this whole thing blows right over. No, he's there for quite a few years, actually. Waiting on the Lord, trusting the Lord, believing that God had a reason for bringing him there. Psalm 105 describes Joseph's uh, in, uh, incarceration there in verse 17. Uh, it says that Joseph, who was sold as a slave, they hurt his feet with fetters. He was uh, laid in irons until the time his word, interpreting the dreams, his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. Wow. Tested him? It looks pretty good to me. I don't think it really needs to be tested anymore. But why, why is the Lord testing him? So the Lord can show Joseph how faithful he is. The Lord doesn't test us to, to show us <laughs> our weaknesses or how strong we are. He, he tests us so we can see how faithful he is. You know, I love the uh, J. Vernon McGee illustration. of uh, He was talking about his uh, young guy growing up. The uh, main bridge in town had washed out in a storm. They came back and rebuilt the whole thing. It's for the train in those days. Uh, and then there was a big day in town, not a lot going on, growing up in Texas at that time, I guess. So big day in town, they're going to test the bridge. How did they test the bridge? Well, they actually brought a train from uh, east and west and drove them both on the, tr on the tracks at the same time to test the bridge so they could show it could hold twice the weight it would ever normally have to hold. Are they hoping the bridge will fall down? No, <laughs> they're, they're showing everyone how strong the bridge is. And uh, when God sends us through a time of testing, like he's doing Joseph here, is not to show us how strong we are. It's to show us how strong he is and how faithful he is. 
Young 17-year-olds ripped out of his house, hauled down to Egypt, one thing after another. You talk about some emotional ups and downs, uh, but he's trusting God, and he's got to be sensing that uh, God is, uh, is doing something in his life. And uh, just uh, I want to encourage you that, uh, that the monuments that you see on that geo today of the pyramids and so forth, uh, when you see those, just remember there's something far greater in Egypt than those things, and it's Joseph. His character and integrity dwarfs those man-made monuments uh, that, are, that are there today. Joseph prospers even in prison. Bernos, verse 20, uh, 21, the Lord was with Joseph, showed him mercy, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Again, the God was with is the key. And of course, as Joseph got marched into that prison, uh, the music swelled in the background, soft violins, there was a crescendo, and then the na narrator spoke and said, and the Lord was with Joseph. And he's like, God, you know, actually that didn't really happen. You know, he's not hearing any of that. We're, we're actually reading the story after the fact. I mean, he's just going into this dungeon, uh, but uh, has no idea what his uh, future holds for him. But uh, uh, here's my question. I meant to pose it to you uh, earlier so you could think about it a little bit. Is that, uh, what do you say to Joseph at this point? You've got a prison visit. you got a prison visit. You're going to go out and see him. He's been there a couple of weeks. You're allowed to see him. You've got about 20 minutes with him. What do you say to him to encourage him? Well, there's a lot we could say, right? We'd say this kind of stuff. Listen, this looks bad right now, right? This, this, I give you, this looks bad. He's like, you're kidding me? It looks bad? I could be here the rest of my life. Uh, you know what the food's like in this place? Uh, you know, it looks bad, but you know, if you're here like this, God's got a reason. God's going to use it. All things work together for good. Give me a break. No, actually, I think Joseph's not cynical. He would have he thanked you for, for saying that. You know, the things that you could say to him in this position... God's got a plan. God's got a reason. You've got to trust him. You've got to hang in there. Hang on to his promises. Well, you can say that to yourself. There's a lot of times when we go through <laughs> from the pit to the pit house to the prison, and maybe he's got a palace, and maybe he just leaves you in the prison, uh, whatever's going on in, in your life, the difficulties. Whatever you could say to Joseph in this and, and there's a lot that we could say, right? I mean, what we know from the New Testament, we know the end of the story. You could even say that to him. This is not the end of the story. You got you to gotta trust the Lord. I say that to people a lot. Yeah, it sounds really bad, but you're still in the middle of the story. You don't know how the thing ends. You don't know how God's going to use this. It's not the end of the story. This, you're still in it. You could say all of that to him. You could say that to somebody else, couldn't you? Going through a, a real difficult time. Hey, do you remember the story about Joseph? And you could tell him the story. You could say, hey, God, God's in the middle of your life. You just got to hang. I know you've been falsely accused of something, but, you know, and, you know, trust God. He's going to give you a way to kind of rejoice over this at some point in time. You're in pretty good company. Whatever it is you're going, someone's going through that you would minister to Joseph, you could minister to them and, and even yourself. You might share Romans 8.35. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written? For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Does that sound real good to you? That sounds very bad to me. We're counted as sheep. We're all being killed like, like uh, animals out here. Uh, and Paul says, yet in all these things, those kinds of things, we're still more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities. Those are the bad demons, by the way. Nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. I don't know what you're going through, but God still loves you. And there's nothing you can do and nothing in this world that he could throw at you that can separate his love from you. And uh, somehow jo Joseph is able to grasp that and hang on to his integrity in the presence of God in his life, no, no matter what he was going through. And he certainly had a sense that God was going to bring that dream to pass, and he would see his brothers again, he'd see his father again, and he would see the descendants, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the shore.
is a guy that uh, we can learn a lot from.